first lesson is from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The psalm is number 105, verses 1 through 6 and 37 to 45. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done his miracles, and the judgments he uttered, O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Then he brought Israel out with silver and gold, and there was no one among their tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread of them had fallen upon it. He spread a cloud for a covering, and fire to give light by night. They asked, and he brought quails, and gave them food from heaven in abundance. He opened the rock, and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. For he remembered his holy promise, and Abraham his servant. So he brought his people out with joy, his chosen ones with singing. He gave them the lands of the nations, and they took possession of the wealth of the peoples, that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. You are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Brilliant, delicious, little red tomatoes spilled out of my hands like marbles in the grass. I couldn't, I couldn't hold them all. The okra and the squash hit, that I had picked earlier had shared all the space that it could share. My hands were overflowing with food 
tomatoes danced out of my hands. My nine-month-old Hayes laughed. I needed a bag or a bowl or, or something to put all this fruit in to hold a harvest that was unfolding before me with far more fruit than I ever thought that it could. I laughed at myself, both for underestimating this little garden and for how much I grumbled about this garden in the beginning. Many of you probably recall me complaining about the relentless poison ivy in my garden back in the spring. You might have even heard me uh, longing for days past when Pamela and I got our fresh vegetables from a CSA like Anatoth. In fact, shortly after I started working on my little garden last spring, that desert of dry soil and poison ivy, I too was quickly tempted to give up to go back and to eat vegetables the way that I was used to. Today, we find Moses, Aaron, and these Israelites at a beginning, and they too are tempted to go back. Last week, we remembered the story of, God's, of God delivering God's people from slavery in Egypt through a miraculous crossing of the Red Sea. Now we find this people at the beginning of a new journey, ready to give up and go back. The people complain against Moses. You have brought us out into this wilderness to kill us. The people longed for the food that they ate back in slavery. If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. Moses doesn't accept their complaint. He redirects it. Who are we? Moses says. Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Perhaps surprisingly, God does not respond to Israel's complaining with rebuke. Instead, we read that God hears Israel's complaining. And that God actually answers Israel's complaint with a blessing. Meat rains down from heaven and this strange substance, this what is it, covers the ground. There is more food than the Israelites can hold. It's everywhere. It's all around them. Manna and quail spilling, dancing out of their hands. And God's blessing is not simply an abundance of meat and manna. The blessing includes something more. On the sixth day, we read, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. By some holy mystery, the food gathered in baskets and prepared in kitchens on that sixth day will multiply so that what the Israels prepared on the sixth day will somehow miraculously also be enough for the seventh. What's fascinating about this is that at this point in the story, the people aren't instructed to gather a double portion on the sixth day. In fact, the instruction to do so and to honor the Sabbath day with rest doesn't come until four chapters later when we hear of the Ten Commandments. So in this moment, where we meet Moses and Aaron and the Israelites today, God magnifies God's blessings so that the people just don't have to work on the seventh day. God's provision, God's gift comes without any prescription at all, without any command. God doesn't tell the people how they'll have to spend the Sabbath. That comes later. God's blessing at this moment in the story is a sheer gift. As one commentator writes, long before the reader wondered about the Sabbath, the motif of the people's discovery adds one more charming element to the story. This joyous gift of the manna is a surprise party. Imagine 
One Thursday night after a long day's work, heading into the end of the week, you're tired and you know you've got to get up, go out and gather more food. You've got to come home, you've got to cook, you've got to be ready to feed yourself or your family or your friends once again. You take a deep sigh and you walk over to the refrigerator to see what you'll need. And there, sitting in your fridge, is a delicious, ready-prepared meal. You just get to enjoy a night off. No shopping, no cooking, no dishes, no cleaning, no labor. God has done it for you. Enjoy it. It is the bread we read in Exodus. The Lord has given you to eat. One of you saintly people gave Pamela and I one of those Foster's family meals shortly after Hayes was born. It was like manna to us. A whole week without gathering, without cooking, without cleaning. We enjoyed it. It sustained us. But why does God do this for Israel? The closest we get to an answer, at least in our passage today, is in verse 6 through 7. God says, in the evening, when you get all that quail, you shall know that the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. And in the morning, when you enjoy that sweet manna, you will see the glory of the Lord. God blesses, God feeds Israel so that Israel might know God and know that this God is Israel's Lord. God blesses Israel so that Israel might remember all the many ways that God has intervened to deliver and provide. In a history that is still in the making, as it were, God blesses Israel so that Israel might remember at each step of the journey that God is the source and sustainer of Israel's life. This history continues to unfold. Today's psalmist remembers this history unfolding. Later Christian commentators will even connect this unfolding by connecting the mysterious manna, this what is it, to the ongoing unfolding blessing that God extends through the mysterious food of God's word, the scriptures, through the sacramental food of the Eucharist, and through Christ's body, the church, all these breads, all these blessings, all these gifts for the world. Did you catch that? God's plan, God's saving acts unfold over time. From delivering Israel out of bondage in Egypt to providing manna in the wilderness to the offering of the bread of Christ who nourishes the church so that the church might become bread blessing for the world. And all along the way of this unfolding, God blesses God's beloved so that we might remember that the God of all creation is the Lord. God blesses so that we might remember and praise God to be Lord. In the first few centuries of the church, this idea of God's saving work unfolding over time was debated. Indeed, some early Christians would have questioned our preaching these last few weeks from the Old Testament at all. People like Marcion and Valentinus, for instance, held the view that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament were entirely different. The God of the Old Testament, they argued, was a God of judgment and wrath the God who kills Pharaoh and his army in the story that we heard last week. They maintained that this God was a lesser God than the God of the New Testament. The God of the New Testament, they suggested, is a God of mercy and love. I wonder how many Christians, how many churches quietly accept this view today. But consider the implications. First, if the God of the Old Testament is distinct from the God of the New, 
then that means that creation, mountains and streams, tomatoes and animals, our very bodies are brought into being by a God who is not God at all. It would mean that creation has no ultimate destiny. Rather, those beautiful, delicious tomatoes in my garden are bodies that embrace, that cry, that pray, and that love are nothing more than the caprice of an otherwise arbitrary creative force. Even more problematic, it would mean that the God revealed in Jesus is distinct, cut off from creation, and therefore redemption would, involve, would not involve the restoration or healing of this broken world, but rather escape from it. Indeed, escape from the material world was the hope to which many of these early groups aspired. As we continue to hear news of devastating hurricanes in Houston and Florida and the Caribbean, as we hear these tragic stories of earthquakes from Mexico, as we hear about week-long protests in St. Louis and of children's legal status being questioned for the sake of political maneuvering, of nations threatening nuclear war, we too may be tempted to think of this broken world as something that we ought to escape from. But the church rejected this escapist view and instead argued that the God of all creation described in the Old Testament is one and the same as God the Father of Jesus Christ. And because of this unity, the church argues that God, our God, the Lord, tells a different story. The God who speaks valleys and waterfalls into existence, who breathes life into dust to form human beings, that same God moves towards creation again and again to bless and to heal. And God does this until everything that exists is ultimately set free to fulfill its ultimate destiny. In Christ's incarnation and resurrection, God sweeps humanity, us, that most fragmented and broken part of creation. God sweeps us into God's self. In so doing, God affirms that creation, this broken world, is not something to escape from at all. Rather, creation is the wound that God chooses again and again and again to enter into through an unfolding series of ointments, of healing balms, so that God's beloved might know and praise the God who continually acts to bless and to heal creation until all creation reaches its ultimate destiny the destiny that is communion with God. The psalmist echoes this for us this morning. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. The psalmist here is exhorting us to tell all those stories of God showing up to bless us so that we might remember that God is constantly at work in this world. Sing to him, the psalmist tells us. Sing praises to him. Tell of all God's wonderful works. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he uttered. Praise the Lord. Remember the wonderful works he has done. Recounting the long history of God's ongoing, unfolding blessing to Israel, the psalmist is clear that God's people are to remember and retell the stories of God's blessing. The same God who made promises to Israel at the beginning will fulfill them. That same God is Israel's God. That same God is the Father of Jesus Christ. In Exodus, God enters the wound of Israel's slavery and blesses Israel through deliverance. God enters the wound of Israel's fear and complaint again in the desert by blessing Israel with quail and manna 
so that the people might know and remember the God of all creation is their Lord. The psalmist looks back over an even longer history, recalling God's determination to enter this broken world in order to liberate and sustain God's beloved with an unfolding succession of blessings. In Christ, we too are invited into the story of this God who continues to enter the wound of creation, the wound of our lives, a God who promises to bring it all to completion. Like Israel, we too are blessed so that we might remember the wonderful works God has done. God acts in our lives so that we might know that the God of all creation is the Lord. Notice, neither the, Exodus, no, neither the writer of Exodus nor the psalmist nor Christ have any interest in escapism. God is not delivering us from a broken world into a place of luxury or security. Heaven is not freedom from this world, but the restoration of it. Neither does God call us to remember God's blessing in order to make light of suffering, as if we could ignore the scars that life's wounds leave behind. Nor are we called to remember God's blessing as a way of suggesting that God brings good out of tragedy. Rather, God's call in Exodus and in the Psalms is to remember the history of God's acts. God enters the wounds of slavery, of fear, and brokenness in ways that constantly surprise us. God acts to offer blessing. In the desert, bags miraculously overflow with sweet food. Weary from the week's work, Israel discovers a day's meal already prepared, a day off, a gift. Remembering this blessing gives Israel the strength they need to continue following the God who called them out of Egypt. In the midst of genuinely apocalyptic headlines today, we are tempted towards escapism. We're tempted to abandon this world and its brokenness. We're tempted to despair. We're tempted even more so to believe the lie that we're trapped inside the tyranny of the present moment. Today, God's word breaks us out of the tyranny of the present and sets our lives in the broader context of God's story of healing and deliverance. We, like Israel, are called to see our story beyond the narrow frame of today's food, beyond the tyranny of tweets and relentless news updates. Like Israel, we are swept up into God's story. And like Israel, we are not mere spectators. God makes us characters in God's story, characters in the story of God's unfolding blessing. We're given a role. God chooses to include us in this great story of restoration and healing. How are you telling your story these days? How are we telling our story as a church called Duke Memorial? It's not just about telling our story. It's not just about remembering our blessings so that we can keep perspective that God is in control. Israel is a character in this story, a player through which God blesses the world. And Israel, maybe like us, doesn't deserve such a role. After all, we like Israel are a grumbling and stiff-necked people. But God's inclusion of Israel, of us, in God's story happens by a sheer gift. It's God's choice. John Wesley saw the Methodists as part of God's unfolding story, another chapter in God's ongoing work to bless God's beloved and bring God's creation into holy communion. We too are swept up into God's story. <clears throat> 
let us remember the wonderful works God has done. Let us remember the ways God is making us characters in God's story of blessing and redemption. The God of all creation is the one and the same God who enters our wounds to offer blessing. This God continues to come to us time and time again, continues to enter our wounds until we are healed into perfect communion with the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.